Falcon and the Winter Soldier opens with the new Captain America, John Walker, anxious over his responsibility. Similar to Bucky and Sam, however unlike them, he's not paralyzed by it. His girlfriend absolves him with the phrase, Be yourself. Yeah. They're gonna love you. His mate chats about the world's expectations of his duty. It's Tar Spangled Man with a plan and all that. It's always been in the job description. As a result, there's two parts of Captain America's identity that's emphasized here, the personal and the symbolic. So for the purpose of this essay, let's explore the symbolic side. Let's analyze symbolic power. Ooh. Shut up, Leo. <laughs> I would have liked Falcon to like die in Jamaica, flipping some legs with some jerk, like three, j three jerks. So you have to have your right legs open. You know what? Fine. Here. Oh, you happy yeah. now? What is symbolic power, apart from something that's symbolic and powerful? In media studies, it's about how the media can produce and transmit different ideas that influence our actions and sense of what is. These ideas are called maps. Nick Caudry argued that there are two consequences to these media maps. A, media maps can conflict with other powerful maps like religion and maybe even denaturalize them, like when reality TV was introduced in the Middle East. And B, symbolic power can coincide with other maps, i.e. corporate power, and therefore intensify the naturalization process. Keep all of this in mind because this Falcon and the Winter Soldier episode is focused on criticizing the selective and artificial nature of these media maps because symbols may represent ideas, but they always innately ignore others. After the intro, we follow Walker in his big, massive debut event. The setting is his high school. The interviewer is more interested in painting Walker like a celebrity than treating him like a civil servant. Which in America, I guess they're one and the same now. What is it like being Captain America? Do eagles fly overhead wherever you go? <laughs> Walker is a humble war hero driven by good simple ideals. Like Tommy Lee Jones in Captain America 1, he believes guts is what's important and as a result sincerely admires Steve for it. You win wars with guts. But what I do have is guts. Uh, something Captain America always had, always needs to have, and I'm gonna need every ounce of it. As a result, on one hand, he seems like a nice chap, but on the other hand, everything is all staged. He's effectively part of a big marketing machine, used to create a symbolic and commercial profile to be consumed by the American people. You could say it reinforces a very specific map. Subsequently, Bucky confronts Sam over this and becomes the voice for Steve. This isn't what Steve wanted. Oh my god, so what do you want me to do? Call America and tell him I changed my mind? The teasing continues on the plane, and then develop to the point that they can make fun of each other's failures and trying to follow Steve's example, like Sam's lack of plan. Why not? That's what Steve called you. Steve knew me longer and Steve had a plan. Or Bucky jumping out without a parachute. Furthermore, during the operation, Sam argues, We're not assassins to dispel Bucky's old programming. On one hand, the bickering is just like Anthony Mackie and Sebastian Stan in bloody interviews. I mean, I probably would have to say him. I'm not saying you, dog, so don't say me. Which is fun, but it also shows that by making fun of each other's shortcomings, they're encouraging each other to live outside of Steve's shadow and be more confident with their natural selves, as their own old-fashioned confidence that they previously borrowed from Steve is being stirred back out. Hello, how are you? Good, what did I miss? Nothing. All right, let's go. No, wait. Then there's a dope truck sequence where the flag smashers are stealing medicine. Walker joins in with his mate Hoskins, but everyone gets beaten up and there's a really, really homoerotic bit between Sam and Bucky. Get off of me! Afterwards, they reject Walker's invitation to work together due to their collective loyalty to Steve. And despite having such a punchable face, John is actually a pretty cool dude. You ever jump on top of a grenade? Yeah, actually I have, four times. It's a thing I do with my helmet, it's a reinforcement. Um, Even though he's a total tool that lacks Steve's intuitive spark or his individual moral conscience, he had to track Sam's red wing to know where the action is. And where Sam is sympathetic towards the Flag Smashers, Walker and Hoskins don't question their roles in aiding a new political order that is actively making things worse. Reactivating citizenship, social security, 
health care, basically just managing resources for the refugees who were displaced by the return. Furthermore, Walker's actively against revolutions, which is like the most anti-Steve thing ever. Violent revolutionaries aren't usually good for anyone's cause. Usually say about the people with the resources. The Flag Smashers are then more thoroughly introduced as a strange community comparable to Robin Hood, where they are aiding the disadvantaged by sticking it to the powerful. Their message is... One war. One people. One war. One people. One people. One people. One people. Which isn't bad at all, but there's a sinister music playing behind them, so I guess we're not supposed to trust them yet. Bucky wants to get the shield back and he brings Sam to Baltimore to meet Isaiah Bradley, a forgotten Captain America who dismisses Bucky's redemption and reveals that despite his contributions, he was thrown into prison for 30 years. You know what they did to me for being a hero? They put my ass in jail for 30 years. The country he stood for didn't stand up for him, and in that moment of tension, Sam is even subject to the same intolerance. Look, is this guy bothering no, me? No, he's not bothering me. Do you know who this is? Therefore, Act 2 challenges the patriotic map from before by showing what is ignored by it. So you're telling me that there was a black super soldier decades ago and nobody knew about it? Bucky is then arrested for avoiding therapy, and Sam and Bucky are then thrown into a shared session. They collectively disagree, which paradoxically make them agree. This is ridiculous. Yeah, I agree. See? Making progress already. And the therapist treats them as an interracial gay couple, so I guess the shippers are even more happy now. That's something I use with couples when they are trying to figure out what kind of life they want to build together. They're asked what they want, cross their legs together so closely that their bloody knees touch their balls. <laughs> You happy now? Stare intently and ask each other personal questions. Bucky reveals that he feels deeply betrayed by Sam because his failure makes him insecure about himself. I don't know if I'm worth all this to you. But you did all those years. It wasn't you. So maybe he was wrong about you, and if he was wrong about you, then he was wrong about me. While Sam simply defends himself with the belief that he did what he thought was right. Maybe this is something you or Steve will never understand. But can you accept that I did what I thought was right? Sam doesn't consider himself Captain America because he doesn't fit with the traditional Captain America profile. As the start of the episode emphasizes, unlike John Walker, he's not the typical blonde, white American bro who played football, became a war hero, but instead he grew up on a poor boathouse with a poor family. His best mate died in the war. And before Steve, he was just a simple man who went jogging and hung out in the VA. Are you happy now? Back in the world. Hey, the number of people giving me orders is down to about zero. Sam is like the least glamorous dude ever, and if he took the shield, he would fundamentally change what it means. Hey, man. There's even a joke early on with a kid who calls Sam Black Falcon because he's black. So me, it's Black Falcon. Because I'm black and I'm the Falcon? Well Technically, I mean... Which is like a joke ripped straight from Harvey Birdman, so that's weird. But the point is, Sam's inherent qualities would author something new, as I said last time. Subsequently, despite how everyone's feelings are kind of hurt in the scene, it was cathartic and their partnership is finally built on firmer grounds. They're approached by Walker again, who kind of needs them to legitimize his position symbolically. It'd be a whole lot easier if I had Cap's wingman on my side. <laughs> However, he's also totally targeting innocent people aiding the Flag Smashers. Because after the blip, loads of people were forced to live in refugee camps. We've been targeting civilians who've been helping Carly move from place to place. Bucky taunts Walker for the reason that he recognizes the pressure of being a mindless tool. Things are really intense for you, aren't they, Walker? And they both reject the offer to maintain their autonomy. As a result, they leave as bitter rivals. Bucky and Sam then goes to meet Zemo, which means the next video is probably gonna be about trauma. Yippee. I thought this episode was really great. It didn't feel as bottom heavy as the first one because it didn't shove all the action scenes right at the beginning. And as a massive Paul Verhoeven fan, I appreciated the subtle satirical undertones, not just with the media, but also the way it strategically presents contradicting details in the story. As the audience were told and directed to align with a side that is pretty much opposite to basic moral standards because the flag smashers are literally just kids trying to help poor people and fight against an increasingly divided an unfair world order where you can't even get alone despite saving the world. Are you serious? John Walker consistently treats Sam and Bucky as just merely tools to be disposed of. You hacked my tech? Sorry, it's not exactly hacking. It's government property. 
He's too valuable an asset to have tied up. But so. the freckle girl actually cares about her friends. When they're taking shelter, they know not to take advantage of the hospitality. Carly, we can't stay here for long. And at the end, one of them stays behind to die in order to ensure the medicine leaves. Red Skull's prophecy of the future having no flags has a deeply different connotation now. It's not the end of the imagined community, as Benedict Anderson argued. It's a widening of it, if you will. One war. One people. One people. One people. As a result, if you place this episode, and I guess the entire show, in relations with the original Captain America trilogy, we're witnessing a break in its themes and the development of new ones, as multiple new maps are at conflicts with one another. The flag smashers are pro-globalization and anti-nationalism, the new government is anti-globalization and pro-nationalism, and the only thing that can tip the spear, or at least reconcile them, in a way, is the shield. Captain America as a media symbol can allocate and intensify the legitimacy of one of these sides. Therefore, even though Sam doesn't believe he is appropriate for the shield, that's what makes him the perfect man. Outside of his superior skills and intelligence is someone who's experienced, and as the episode spotlights, racial divisions. So as a symbol, he's something entirely new. They say their mission is to get things back to the way it was during the blip. Maybe they're just trying to help. In conclusion, Sam and Bucky's relationship in this episode reminded me a lot of the KFC Double Down poster. No buns or meat. <laughs> How'd you track up here? The flag smashers. Ah, uh, no, we didn't track them. We tracked you uh, through Red Wing. You hacked my tech? Look at you. All stealthy. A little time in Wakanda and you come out White Panther.